it, it has been the wildest, most amazing thing I have ever done. And to see the looks on these children's faces, you know, when they get to see a drone in the air um, and I get to talk about all the uses of a drone besides just flying it for fun and teaching right. them that they can make money doing yeah. this thing that it just seems like having a great time. Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. My name is Whitney Knox Lee and I'm your host. This is season three of Impostrix Podcast, where we are focusing on validating small business owners of color, entrepreneurs, and folks who unfortunately are navigating employment discrimination in their workplace. Impostrix Podcast always puts folks of color first. So all of our guests are people of color who are sharing about their personal experience or their learned experience. Welcome, friends. Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. I'm your host, Whitney Knox Lee. I am joined today by Roxanne Romulus. She is in the risk management field. I'm looking forward to this conversation because we are continuing our conversations surrounding career change and shifting in career. Um, and as of filming today, Roxanne's been away from her corporate job for about a month, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I'm really, I like this period. I liked this period for myself um, when I was a month out of leaving my nine to five because um, it's just a really exciting, kind of nerve wracking, but exciting and restful time for me. So I'm looking forward to hearing about how Roxanne's been doing. Um, before we get into the conversation, I'm going to have Roxanne introduce herself. So Roxanne, talk to us. Who are you and what identities are you bringing to this conversation? All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Roxanne Romulus, as Whitney has kindly introduced me. Um, I am... First and foremost, uh, the mom of two amazing young ladies. I am a seasoned executive with over 20 years of risk management experience. And I am now, uh, you know, an FAA certified drone pilot pursuing uh, my passion through my new company, uh, Black Girl Drone World, and really looking at how you can take your passions and turn them into a career that can actually sustain you. Um, that's the period of where I'm at in my life at this point, And it's quite the adventure. So I'm very excited <laughs> to be here with you and to share a little piece of my, my story with you. Thank you. And what, what's your racial identity? Oh, I'm black. And uh, I am, I am of Haitian descent. I am, mm -hmm. yes, both of my parents were born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Um, I've visited the country uh, many times and I have a deep love for my country's history. Um, I have deep, deep roots. I still have family there. Um, I do pay close attention to everything that is going on in the country, but I'm very proud Haitian American. Thank you. Okay. So, um, what is risk management? Because I don't know that I really knew of anyone in that field prior to getting to know you. Um, and of course, you and I have talked about it a little bit, but for folks who are unaware, um, what is risk management? What does that entail? A good contract is worth its weight in gold. Are you a creative entrepreneur who contracts your services to others? Well, listen up, because this is for you. The Smithers Law Group has created 14 master contracts specifically for creative entrepreneurs. These contracts are industry specific, they're fully customizable, and you only pay a one-time fee. This is so much better and more affordable than speaking with a attorney who is gonna charge you an hourly consultation fee, and it's so much more secure than just Googling up your contract and hoping for the best. Find your fully customizable and industry specific contract at stulawgroup.com. Search for the contract bank. And don't forget to tell them that I sent you. Okay, so I'll, I'll put it in very basic terms. It's just really trying to avoid taking unnecessary risk. And they can come in a lot of different areas and ways. Uh, risk management is a very broad term, and it comes with a lot of different disciplines within risk management. You know, there's operational risk management. Those are the risks that you take just by being a business entity. 
Um, then there's third party risk management, which is my specialty, uh, which is essentially the risk that you take on by working with a third party to help you provide your products and services. Um, and those can come in a number of different types of risks. You can have reputational risks. Uh, so basically, if you're dealing with a company that has a bad reputation by working with them, you're bringing that risk to your own company. Um, it can come into cybersecurity risks. Well, if you're working with a company to provide you with products and services and you need to provide them with your client's information and they don't know how to protect that information, well, uh, you could be putting yourself in a very bad situation where you could end up with paying fines and also having that secondary effect of your reputation being affected because they don't think of the third party. Right. You gave your, <laughs> they gave you their data. So it was your responsibility to make sure that it was protected and safe. But essentially, it's really just looking at all the potential risks that are available or out there and making an informed decision on how much risk you're really willing to take for your business or personally. It doesn't even have to be around business. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> As a as a business owner now, like that is anxiety producing. <laughs> Thinking about <laughs> all of these risks because it's not something that I think a lot about. Reputation, yes. Um, and even like one of my businesses right now, I'm working on figuring out a good online platform through which to receive money. Um, so I'm obviously concerned about risk there um, and security of data and all of that stuff. Um, but even in terms of of even like subcontracting or contracting work, it's something that I'm not thinking about until something happens. Yes. And you know what? Um, throughout my journey, I mean, I started in a number of different risk dip disciplines. I was in credit risk, uh, which really wasn't all that exciting to me. I went down the wormhole of model risk and liquidity risk. And, you know, I was a, a banker, you know, I'd been in banking for mm. a, quite a bit of my career. And um, I love to teach and I love to train. And I always seem to find a way to squeeze it into any job that I've ever had. Um, and an opportunity presented itself uh, for training around third-party risk. That opportunity just took me from trainer to managing a portfolio of, um, you know, IT vendors and getting an opportunity to just go from behind the scenes to right in the middle of the pot <laughs> and mm -hmm. really get to understand corporations' desires uh, and where they're spending their money and, and how that spend is so important to their overall strategy and where they're trying to go. And uh, it, I just fell in love. I fell in love with it and I took it so far as I want to build a program for you company uh, from the ground up. You don't have anything in place. You need it. Um, and I'm going to take you from an Excel spreadsheet, which is what you were using, you know, to actually vet these vendors to something that's state of the art, to something that can pass a regulator's exam. And um, I've built it for a few companies and I really loved it, really loved mm. it. Um, and then, uh, you know, I got to, I, I think the best point in, in my career, I was, I had a wonderful team that I had the opportunity to hire. And that always feels good when you're able to, you know, give jobs and help people to sustain their own families. You know, that's an area that I am very, very grateful for. Um, and in some cases, when you do your job so very well, the reward is more work. And I, I fell into that where I was basically working two full-time jobs, literally, meaning that I had one job description and I took on another job description. And I uh, was just told that I should be able to handle it, you know, that I and I for a while, you know, I think I might have had a little bit of a perfectionism in there, you know, really trying to juggle all the balls. And uh, after many sleepless nights, you know, finding myself waking up 
and thinking about, you know, what, what did I do at work? Or is there something I didn't get to at work? Or having my children, you know, uh, my youngest is four, come up to me and like close my laptop for me. Mm. You know, just kind of like, well, okay. My nine-year-old's like, well, when does work end? mommy, you know, Mm -hmm. when does it come to a close? Like, when do we, when do we get our time? And then I realized that even though I had this, you know, wonderful career uh, to an outsider, you know, looking in that I was really killing myself. And then I got Mm -hmm. to a point where, you know, I got sick and that really was eye opening for me. Um, of course, it's my body talking to me and telling me that I am doing too much and that I need to slow down. But, you know, the response of being sick was an interesting one in terms of, you know, employee, employer, you know, type relationship because it was, you know, it, and it was pretty serious. And, you know, I'm, you know, in the ER calling work. You know, to make sure, making sure I bring my laptop. Somebody has to get me my laptop, you know, <laughs> craziness. You know, I you laugh, get- <laughs> but it's not funny. <laughs> crazy, completely crazy. And um, I remember talking to, you know, my manager at the time. And I mean, again, it was very serious. And it was just, I hope you feel better. And yeah. that was kind of one of those moments where, I was, I, I think I'm, I might just be a commodity myself. Like I, I didn't feel like I was a person, you yeah. know? Um, and that was it. That was the only thing that was ever said, you know, to address the fact that, you know, I'd had this life threatening thing happen to me. And it really kind of made me think long and hard about, you know, my time and what I wanted to do with my time and how I wanted to spend my time. And, uh, you know, I'm not shy. I'll be 47 next month. And, uh, you know, I've got my mom's jeans. I just look like a baby. Um, but uh, yes, you do. <laughs> I, I really started to think, what do you want to do with your time? And how can you get uh, a level of balance you know, back into your life. Um, And yes, I was a stellar employee. I had five years of exceptional, you know, performance appraisals. And I was exhausted. I was mentally exhausted, uh, physically exhausted, just from not getting enough sleep. And I just wanted to be more present with the time that I have. I wanted to be doing things that mean a lot to me um, and bring me happiness and joy. And I, I loved my corporate career, you know, don't get me wrong. Uh, but it, once it turned into me working the, <laughs> the two full-time jobs, I just wasn't able to be the ever-present, loving, wonderful, attentive mommy that I've always been. And, you know, you have to think about the cost right. um, because I, I know my, my little one will not be four again. You know, it's, right. you get one shot, you know, really <laughs> to, to get it right and to do it right. And I don't want to look back and, you know, just say, oh, I really wasn't there or I really wasn't paying attention Um, or look and blink because they grow so fast, my goodness, that they're like on their way off to college. And I missed, you know, the whole period where mom's still cool, you know, and they want (laughs) to hang out with you. You know, I want to enjoy that because I know I'm only a few years away from my oldest, probably being like, "Eh, I want to go hang out with my friends. I want to do, you know, so while mommy's still like the coolest ever, you know, let's, let's enjoy that time. Um, and it was difficult for me to yeah. walk away from that career. It, it was very, very challenging. It was not an easy thing for me. Um, but something had to give. And I've yeah. worked since I was 15 and a half. The day that I was legally able to get a job, I went out and got a job. And I have been working ever since. 
and the thought of me walking away from a job, you know, uh, was just mind boggling even to me, you know, like, oh my goodness, how could you like walk away from this and walk away from what, what I felt was quote unquote security. Yeah. You know, that, that check, you know, coming on the 15th and the last business day (laughs) of, of the month. And, you know, but how much security is that if you're not well? Yeah, I'm going to um I'm going to ask you some questions about this transition in a second, but I'm a couple of things that you said at the outset really struck me and that is around the perfectionism um and you know, we do our do- jobs so well that stuff just gets added to the plate because we can handle it. And I particularly as black women, um the the superwoman mentality that we have of ourselves but also that other people have of us, um, for me, has been something that I've really had to negotiate um, in in various work settings where I find myself taking on more than I bargained for. And even in volunteer, volunteer opportunities, um, you know, and, and it reminds me too that for myself, ego is also a part of it. Um, the, and the perfectionism and the ego go hand in hand for me as far as like, this is something that I'm proud of. I'm proud of being a hard worker and I'm proud of excelling. And to some extent, like how much of my identity is wrapped around this idea that Whitney will do all the things, um, and you can go to her for those things. But it's also the case that we, you know, are taken advantage of to some extent, but to all the extents, um, when it comes to our labor um, and when it comes to this racial capitalization, ca- yes, racial capitalism, there we go, um, where our labor um, is commodified. And so you said something to the effect of you realize that you were the commodity um, and that the moment that you're out, it's, it's not really like you're not a the person anymore and i'm i'm working with one organization right now to help them restructure their their organization and i'm not saying that they struggle with with this issue of kind of overusing folks but what is certainly the case is this organization is small enough that as people excel in their jobs, their jobs grow. And so to the point where now they have these positions that are multiple positions in one, and there's no recording of what the position actually is anymore, um, which makes it really difficult for that organization to plan moving forward. So in your case, if something happens to the position the person that's holding your position, um, if something happens to you, like you get sick and you have to be hospitalized, then what happens to your work? And who's who knows how to actually do all of your jobs? And who is going to be able to step in? Because that's the thing that your supervisor should be asking or talking about when you call from the hospital. They should be saying, okay, no worries. These are the people, like we already have this this situation dealt with because of how our organization is run. We know who the backups for each thing are. We know how to do your job. So Roxanne, just get well. Don't think about work. Don't have your laptop um, because we've got you. And oftentimes that's not what we're hearing when, when we have these very real health issues. 100%. And I, I definitely didn't hear it. And, you know, in addition to me trying to heal and get better, I was also worried about work, you know, at the same time. And, you know, you really can't have the two. They, they are opposites. They're, they're not, you can't heal and be worried, uh, you know. So ultimately for me, I, I, I needed a break. I, I needed yeah. a, a desperate break to just be able to pause and reset and refocus on what is really important, you know, to me. Um, What are the skills that, you know, God has blessed me with? Um, And 
how do I make sure that I'm utilizing them to the best of my ability and don't end up in that situation? I want to reflect on how I ended up there. Um, you know, it had gotten to a point where uh, if I said no to anything, well, you're not a team player. Mm-hmm. You're just not a team player. And that's not good that you're you're not a team player. And I'm like, well. You're not committed <laughs> anymore. Yeah. yeah. It's like, how, how could you say no to something? And I'm yeah. like, well, I mean, I, I don't have a lot of extra hands. I mean, I can only do what I can do. And, you know, it got to a point where it was like, okay, you know, you know I'm only seeing my kids awake three hours a day. You know, and yeah. that's to feed them. You go over homework and then hurry them off to bed. And, uh, you know, I just, I didn't want that anymore. It didn't, it really didn't sit well uh, with me. And I really wanted to be present and to be able to enjoy all facets of me. I, I've got lots of things that I love doing. Um, and, you know, flying drones. Uh, became my my passion, my baby, um, my I call it my third child, and you know building Black Girl Drone World, uh, which is an education company, you know focused on teaching girls of color. I'm very intentional about the mission um, and women of color. So between the ages of eight and 24, you know that this is a STEM career. Uh, this yeah. is an area of aviation that is new and emerging. And there are very few pilots that look like me. And this is an opportunity, you know, if you are interested in getting into STEM, uh, you know, getting into aviation, that this is an avenue and I'm going to create an avenue for you to learn about it, uh, to get certified in it. And um, I feel good doing it. You know, I, I, I love helping other people. I love creating a career path, you know, for other people. And I had the opportunity to do that in, in corporate. And I, I just thought a lot of these skills that I have developed over many, many years in, in corporate America, you know, how can I leverage them? How can I utilize them in my day-to-day life? And why do I think so small that, you know, that's the only option is, you know, it, corporate is the only option. Why can't I be more than that? Uh, why can't I have, uh, you know, a business of my own um, as in addition to, you know, working in corporate? And when I made that decision six years ago to, you know, embark on this journey, and it, it has been the wildest, most amazing thing I have ever done. And to see the looks on these children's faces, you know, when they get to see a drone in the air. Um, and I get to talk about all the uses of a drone besides just flying it for fun and teaching right. them that they can make money doing yeah. this thing that it just seems like having a great time. And what a better way uh, to, to sustain yourself. Uh, I teach them about entrepreneurship because hey, it's important to understand how business works. Uh, There are a lot of benefits, financial benefits to having your own business, tax benefits to having your own business. And you can, you know, fly your drone commercially as young as 16. Uh, Aren't we all struggling with, you know, the ROI on college, you know, these days? So, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So um, let me ask you, because as I as I said early on, you just recently left um, your corporate job. So like, what's what's this like? How are you feeling? How how is it going? So um, we are recording on a Sunday. Okay, so I feel it the most on a Sunday because Mm. normally that would be. (sighs) <sighs> okay, get ready for Monday. We got to go back to it. We got to, you know, get back on the yeah. grind. And it's an early start, and you, you get a day full of packed, jammed meetings. And I think that was probably a, a huge challenge. It was like, where is the time to do the work? If you're in meetings, you know, from eight to four, 
that leaves yeah. you no alternative but to use the time that you would be spending with your family, you know, as work time. Um, and, you know, I feel it on on the Sundays because that would be mm -hmm. the time that I would be getting prepared. Um, but I will tell you, I'm, I'm much well uh, better rested uh, than I've been in a very, very, very long time. Uh, so I do appreciate, you know, and the kids are out of school too. That also helps that I'm not waking up at five, you know, in the morning uh, to kind of get the day going. Um, it, it's new, you know, it's very new. Um, and I, I, I think most of it is that just missing the camaraderie, I think of the mm. people that I worked with and, um, you know, I was more than just like a, you know, employee that does my job. You know, I really, really exemplified bringing my whole self to work. So if there was a women's group, I was on it. You know, if there is some type of volunteer opportunity, I was there. You know, any opportunity to make sure that I wasn't just there behind the scenes, but in front of the scenes as well to, you know, be a good steward and representative, you know, of that organization because, you know, I, I was grateful and very grateful for the opportunity that I had um, with that company and spending five years there. But yeah, I wake up now and it's like, okay, it's a uh, focus on the kiddos. Um, we get to go for a walk every day. And mm. I think that's my happiest time and moment. I mean, I've lived in the same community for 20 years. And wow. probably the first time that I am walking around and meeting new neighbors and just getting some fresh exercise every, mm. you know, single day. So it's it's forcing me to really focus on the little things um, and having time to to notice the little things and talking more with my children um, and having these little conversations where I, I, I spend a lot of time listening now, you know. Sometimes I was so distracted, so into a project or a deliverable or that, you know, I just wasn't able to really hear them, uh, you yeah. know, and now I can sit back and listen and talk to them and, you know, hear what they're thinking, you know, what's going on in their mind. They ask me a ton of questions. And, uh, you know, I'm a wealth of information. <laughs> so I've just been enjoying, you know, spending time. And, um, you know, the other thing is, you know, I'm getting married. Oh. Yes. Yes. I'm getting married. Um, Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm getting married um, in May of next year. And I, I also found myself delaying my own wedding because of work. Mm, I was yeah, like, okay, wow. like, oh my goodness, well, I can't get married then because there's this project and I have this other project and this other project. And I just thought, wait a minute, <laughs> what yeah. are you doing? Like, this is my life. Yes. Get married when you want to get married. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's new. It's different. Um, it's definitely an, a, an adventure. And mm. I think I'm enjoying like um the uncomfortableness of it uh, <laughs> yeah yeah it's it it is uncomfortable because you're just accustomed to things being a certain way but i i think it's difficult to grow when you get stuck and i was feeling myself getting stuck just willing to you know, do whatever needed to get done, you know, at the expense of things that were just way too valuable to me, you know, and I, yeah. I just decided, and it really was like that. I just decided, and I'd been thinking about it for a while, but I really was, after I would just had this experience uh, that was not pleasant and I was I'm like, you know, am I really going to be able to win? I don't know if I'm going to be able to win this because there's just not, I'm not two people. Um, and this would really require. <laughs> I'm one person. But yes, I cannot like morph into a second Roxanne. So um, I need to make a decision. I, I need to make a choice. And and once I made my decision, I, I stood behind it. And it's not to say that I won't ever, you know, go and work for corporate. 
I, I mean, I, I loved my corporate life, you know, so it's not to say yeah. that it's the end, you know, like I'll never yeah. go back or that there's any type of negative feelings about it. I had a wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, career at every employer that I've had. Um, but I learned a very, you know, difficult and hard lesson that I can't be all things to all people. Mm-hmm. And it's most important that I am true to myself mm-hmm. above any salary. You know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do anything that makes me feel as though I've betrayed myself. And I had gotten to that point of just being so tired that I, I had not even, I didn't even recognize, you know, myself and uh, yeah. this little bit of time to just recharge, um, refocus, uh, and get, you know, a little more into my passions and, you know, third party risk is my passion. I really love this. When I felt, tell you, I fell in love with this risk discipline. Um, I'm getting ready to release a book. Mm. Yes. I, you know, I'm just I'm so, so much going on. I know. I and, and you know what? I'm a little, you know, I got to be doing stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I like to be doing stuff, but make sure it's the stuff you love. Um, so I love writing. You know, I love teaching. Um, so this is our busy season for Black World Drone World where we do a lot of, you know, summer camps. Um, you know, over in Buckhead and sometimes over in South Fulton. Um, so we're excited about that. You know, when the school year uh, comes up, it'll be time to come to those STEM days, those career Mm -hmm. days, um, and getting the opportunity to talk to as many youth as possible and partner with as many educators as possible. Um, and I think I'll probably do some consulting around third-party risk. I do have a passion for uh, small businesses, uh, women-owned, minority-owned businesses, as I am, you know, myself. And uh, I think the areas of third-party risk is something that, you know, we're all living and breathing, but not really thinking about it. So uh, I think it is extremely important to just educate each other on, on what we know. And I, I know a lot in this space and can help small businesses that don't have big budgets, don't have a massive department, you know, to, to help do questionnaires, just to understand what are the really important salient things that I need to know as a business owner. And even some of the things that they can put themselves in a better position to work with a corporate client you know, on the other Mm, side of it, you know, it was my job to vet every third party that a big company wanted to work with. And the little guys struggled because Mm. they didn't have the bells and whistles that a big company was looking for and sometimes couldn't pass all of the due diligence requirements. And I think I can help uh, really educate that smaller entity that wants to have that big corporate client and help them to get in the door. So it's one thing, you know, to be a diverse supplier that that's always great. There's, there's always a need for that and a desire to have more diversity, you know, in the inventory of of vendor spend, but it's a whole other thing when you have to go and pass the due diligence as well. And do you know what they need from you from a security perspective Do you know what they need from you from a privacy perspective or compliance or any other (laughs) one of the areas that you dig deep into? Um, But I want to help. I I think that's just the general theme is that whatever I end up doing today, tomorrow, I I want it to have meaning and I want to be able to help as many people as possible to achieve their dreams uh, I think that's a, mm. essentially the the way that I feel about it right now is that everything that I touch and everything that I do and with my time will be something that is very meaningful um, and helping mm. to achieve that. Whether it's a big dream, small dream, I mean, we, we need to keep dreaming, you know. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So when you were deciding that you were going to, that this job was no longer conducive to the Roxanne that you wanted to be into the family life that you wanted to have. 
Um, what were your biggest kind of fears or hurdles that you needed to overcome um, in order to actually give your notice and like actually do the thing? Well, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is, is the money. Yeah, your finances. Mm-hmm. What 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 kind of financial shape am I in? Am I going to be able to, you know, weather uh, this period of time uh, without that fifteenth and the thirtieth? So right. I, I definitely did some some soul searching, some financial planning, just to make sure uh, that we would be okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was definitely something that was top of mind. It was, have you saved enough, you know, um, yes. and you know, you become laser focused on where you're spending your money, why you're spending <laughs> your money. Like, okay, maybe, maybe we don't need to go out to eat. Maybe I need mm-hmm. to just use my wonderful chefing skills and just cook, you know, cook at home. And, um, it's, it's helped to kind of make things a little simpler, uh, oh, really. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I was really kind of nervous about was just, you know, leaving or the relationships, you know, that I mm-hmm. had built up, you know, for, for so many years and that were so important to me. Uh, because, you know, when you leave a company, you know, sometimes they last and sometimes it's like sayonara. Don't, re- don't even remember your name anymore. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, I really want to make sure that I keep um, those relationships that are important to me. So I keep the line of communication open. You know, I, I left on good terms. So it wasn't like, you know, anything weird was around it. But, you know, I definitely felt like, uh, you know, the team didn't want me to leave. And that, that yeah, was difficult, right. you know, it was like, yeah. oh, you know, they, I, I wish I could stay, but I, I, I think this is one of those moments where I have to choose myself. Yeah. Yeah. I can relate to both of those challenges um, because for me, you know, there was a, a close knit group of folks who I really enjoyed working with, who I knew had my back, who I knew had the same vision as me, not only as far as like our company mission, um, but also as far as what our work ethic was like, what our boundaries, what right. boundaries we were going to have right. with each other and with the work. Um, and they really helped me to grow as a professional. Uh, and it was, you know, really sad leaving um, because I'm frankly just not a good person. Like I'm not the person that stays in touch with everybody. I'm not good at that. Um, I have a couple of friendships from, uh, Seattle from back home. I've been gone now for more than 10 years. And I swear the reason why these people are still really good friends of mine is because of their effort. Um, (laughs) and I'm glad about it. I'm really glad about it. But like, I, I'm not great at maintaining relationships that aren't right in front of me. Um, so that was difficult. And the financial component, like my husband and I are constantly reminding ourselves, like, we don't have the income that we used to have. We hope to surpass that income in time uh, with our own perspective, um, business ventures. But like right now, today, we don't have that income. So we can't keep acting like we do. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, trying to communicate that to our children who don't understand that yeah. money doesn't come up, you know, grow off trees. Um, they were used to a certain lifestyle that we are now trying to scale back and um, they do not understand why we're not going out to our favorite Mexican restaurant every Friday now. It just is the, the financial component is absolutely a huge consideration. Um, it was for us when we both ended our jobs, um, our full-time jobs, but it was also similar to you. Like it was a decision that couldn't be put off any longer. Um, and uh, you know, if it could have, it would have, you know, like if we could continue to live the lifestyle that we were living in terms of work, in terms of how much emotional energy, we needed to have to be in our in those roles in terms of the time and what it was taking away from the family like if we could have we would have um but we couldn't 
And so there became a point where it was like, yeah, no, when we leave our jobs, we are not going to have as much money. That's just like, there's no way around that. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was absolutely a hurdle and it's still something that we're, we're navigating obviously. And now it's been, it's been, uh, several months since both my husband and I have been on our own entrepreneurial journeys. Um, so yeah, health insurance was another one yes. for us um, because it is so costly. So that was another another big one. That was like one of those, I can't leave my job because I need health insurance. Um, I, I mean, you can imagine. You can imagine. That was a very tough decision for me to mm-hmm. make considering, considering, you know, uh, what what had happened to me, you know, yeah. months, months prior. And, you know, I will say that I've definitely gotten into um, more holistic health. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that usually does not require insurance. So that, to me, has really helped to supplement a little bit of, you know, Mm. going to, yeah, going to the doctor, um, really trying to allow myself the time and space and my body the time and space to to heal. I do believe that your body wants to heal um, if it's given the right environment um, that it, it can do what it needs to do. So my in terms of health, my mindset is very, very um, positive. But you are right, okay? That is not a good feeling at all, um, especially with small children. When yep. you're when you're dealing with the health insurance, but you know what, it was one of the things where I said, "Hey, you know what? Uh, we're just gonna not be going out to the dinners, okay? Right. The dinners are gonna go because the health insurance must stay. Um, right, right. Like that's a non for my family. It's a non negotiable. Um, yeah, and it is expensive. Like it sucks. I also learned through this process that you can't actually purchase health insurance on the market that is as good as your employer paid health insurance. That's very true. That has been an adjustment for us too. It's like we're paying way more money for just worse health insurance. (laughs) That is true. Um, It's it's, there's no way there's no nice way to put it. Um, You know, you just are grateful for some type of coverage and you know, I really try to do my best. Like it has to be something really big to go to the doctor, you know, before when you have the, you know, health insurance, you might say, all right, well, just just go to the doctor, just go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, okay, what's in the chest? Uh, What's, what's in the bathroom that we could use to (laughs) to alleviate this? What natural remedy can we try to, to get us through this? So it really makes you think real, really long and hard about, you know, going to the doctor uh, because now there's just like this, exorbitant amount of money that could end up coming out of your pocket for like one visit. One yeah. visit. We ain't going to the ER. Mm-mm. You must have a body part falling off of you to go to the <laughs> ER. I understand so much. Yeah. I just look at the um, kids like, be careful. <laughs> yeah. Right. Don't Wear fall. a helmet. Do all the things. Exactly. Walk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, so let me ask you, you, um, you know, in our podcast, of course, we talk a lot about imposter syndrome and self doubt and feeling like a fraud. Um, you have a lot going on right now, uh, having just left your job, of course, but having these other opportunities, these other kind of thoughts around how you can really capitalize on yourself as a resource. So including like writing the book and potentially consulting and black girl drone world. Do you deal with that feeling of being an imposter or that feeling of, you know, that kind of overwhelming self doubt as you are kind of staring these, these options in the, in the face? Oh, uh, every day, every Mm. day. Uh, so as I started on my journey as a drone pilot, you know, one of the first things that I wanted to do was talk to other people that, you know, look like me, that were in the space that, you know, um, were apparently or looked like they were doing it, you know, and I remember having those conversations and just then never hearing from those people ever again. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Never. It's I, I don't know what it was. It was like, okay, maybe they just wanted to know what I was working on or what I was planning to do. And I thought that, okay, we can all, there's space for everybody. You know, we can, we can all do this together. And then I realized just how lonely doing this was going to be, you know, for me and created a lot of self-doubt um, about, okay, well, can I actually do this? And I remember, um, you know, having, um, so I, this is my second drone business. I had a drone business before with a partner and I remember my, my partner at the time saying, well, you know, you don't have a license, so you, you, you know, you're not the business and yeah, you're, you, you don't have a license, like kind of like, you know, and I thought to myself, well, there's nothing really stopping me from getting this license. <laughs> and uh, so then my my it piqued my interest, you know, kind of like, OK, so, OK, that's this is my next thing. This is what I have to do. And I really talked myself um, talk about self-doubt. I was like, it's a federal uh, certification. OK, it's feds. It's it's serious. It's feds. I, you know, I just mm -hmm. was like, oh, my gosh, maybe that's just a little too hard for you. Then I said, well, it's a test. I don't do well with tests. I've never done well with standardized tests. So probably not going to do that great at this at all. Um, and even though those thoughts continue to pop into my mind, I just kept going. It is the most craziest thing in the world to continue moving forward when you are still feeling self-doubt because everything is telling you to just put it down or, you know, just give it up. Um, or you know, just leave it alone. You know, why did you think you could do all, any of that anyway? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember my terror and fear sitting outside of the testing center, like, oh my gosh, you know, I really have to go in here and yeah, I passed this test on a computer, you know, at home, but that's not the same, you know, it's not going to be right, the same right. when I get in there. And then I got in there and I, you know, passed that test with a 90, which is rare. Yes. On, on a first try to do that. And those are the moments where the confidence continues to build. Um, and that just kind of kept pushing me forward and gave me my story, you know, to that I can share with other people who I right. want to come along on this journey with me and tell them, look, you know, I, I thought I was going to fail this test. I thought I wasn't going to be able to do it. And I was able to persevere. And I want other girls, other women, uh, you know, to understand that you can do this. It, it, I know the drones it sounds like really fancy, you know, they, <laughs> they hear <laughs> drones and they're like, oh, and I'm like, no, it's trust me. I can show you everything that you need to know. Um, even if you don't make it your full time thing, uh, you can make it your side hustle. I mean, if, if, yeah. if anything this has taught me that you should always have multiple streams of income. Right. Always. Absolutely. <laughs> so what are the different, because um, of course there's lots of black women that listen to this podcast and I've heard you and I've heard others talk about just all the different income streams that being a drone pilot can bring in, including like um, what aerial photography for real estate or um, other things that you need. I know the roofers yes. use drones to yes. check out the roofs. So talk to us about what um, what can we do with a drone license or a drone oh. pilot's license, I guess. Well, there's a couple of different ways that you should consider it. So there's the path of actually working for a drone company. So this is not you being independent. This is you working for a larger institution. Um, those organizations offer really great pay. Uh, because mm. it is kind of a niche to have that license. There are not a lot of licensed people in the United States. I think there might be about 300,000 people in the United States that are licensed. And, mm -hmm. you know, of those, 92% of them are men. 8% mm -hmm. right, are right. women. And of those 8%, I mean, there's probably three of the 8% that look like me. Um, right. But you could go and work for, for get a full time job as a drone pilot. You could be working in a lot of different industries. You could do something for construction. You know, a lot of construction companies want to see their build over time. 
Um, you know, you come in, you'll be able to fly your drone, take those aerial pictures. So yes, the pictures are a lot, a part of it, <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> but mm-hmm. it applies to a lot of different other industries as well, right, but you could right. go into it as an, an individual. So I, that's what I've done. I've gone into the education track. Most people don't think about education as, you know, and drones, but that was my, you know, sweet spot. Um, there's many other applications, uh, you know, for drones. I mean, we're going into sports. There's mm. drone soccer, a whole sports league for drone soccer that kids are being able to play right now. They have teams, leagues. They win prizes, money. Um, they have drone racing. Wow. Yes. Like with full-on specialized tracks on television. Uh, with large pots of money as the prize, uh, you know, so I always mm-hmm. say if you're like a gamer, you know, a drone <laughs> a drone is your sweet spot because mm-hmm. it's pretty much the, the same kind of, you know, hand eye coordination that you would need in order to be able to to fly the drone. But, yeah, real estate agents, their drone pilot is their buddy. You know, who doesn't want to see the <laughs> whole you know, aerial view of yeah. the plot of land that comes along with your home. Who doesn't want to feel like they're actually walking in the front door of the home? So right. it really gives you a, a more unique and a competitive edge for a lot of the real estate agents that can get a drone pilot to do a lot of the um, imagery to help them advertise, you know, their, their new piece of property that they're getting ready to sell. Um, but then there are just like these other amazing uses of drones for good. So I, I, when I mentioned healthcare, a lot of people are like, why would somebody need a drone for healthcare? But, you know, during COVID, uh, there was a lot of drone companies that were in high demand because they were flying and dropping PPE. So all of that equipment, the gloves Mm, at the rooftop of the hospital and being able to keep people from having close physical contact. Um, You know, law enforcement uses drones. Um, They're used in search and rescue. So you can use a drone that has specialized equipment that will allow you to see in the dark, you know, to Mm -hmm. sense heat. Um, And that is communicating down to the police officers that are on foot to let them know what direction or, you know, I've seen video footage of a young boy that got lost in the woods. I mean, could you imagine like, oh, the terror for that mother, but the drone yeah. really came and, and saved the day by making it basically being the police officer's eyes in the dark. Right. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that you'll start to see now, if you are, you know, an independent, you know, drone pilot, and I'm seeing it a lot, um, is either they're following crime scenes. Um, uh, so <laughs> they'll be like the first person on scene to be able to get some video footage or, uh, a disaster. So if there's like mm, a storm, uh, because yeah. you can maintain a very good distance away from the actual like center of what happened, if it was like a tornado or a hurricane and be able to get some really great footage, aerial footage of, you know, just what the extent of the damage is. And I've seen a lot of drone pilots now being the ones being interviewed on the news. Oh, uh, wow. Yes. Ooh. Yes. To provide their, yeah. you know, a description of what it was that they were able to capture uh, with their drone. But then there's always the fun stuff where you could just go and take pictures and, you know, have it at the wedding. You know, sometimes at a wedding, they want the, a, a okay. shot of every single person that came in one shot. You can't really get that on the ground. So you can you do a lot of fun and unique uh, pictures and videos with the drone that you can't do as like a standard photographer would be able to get. But yeah, there's lots and lots of opportunity um, because it's such a niche you know, you can command maybe $65 to $75 an hour. Maybe your job might not even take that long. You know, right. it's it's not bad. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely a, a really good side hustle if it's something that you're looking for an extra, you know, stream of income. And your friends will always want something from you. I mean, we're in Atlanta. This is the, the land of film and video. Yep. All of that is being done on on drones 
at this point. Most of the shots that you see are on drones. And back in the day, for those movies, they had to hire a helicopter to wow. get those yeah. views. Wow. <laughs> It's very exciting um, to see to see it happening, um, and I brought my daughter along for the ride. So right. my daughter is a great <laughs> drone pilot herself, and uh, she comes out with me. Um, of course, school permitting, like uh, yeah. you know, to all of the events, and it's always best for her to show the yeah. other children that you know if she can do it, that they can do it, and you know, flying since she was four, and mm. um, she's very technical and yeah she's she's stem all the way um but wow. she gives me a lot of joy when she tells me that um i'm gonna take over the business mom in my oh. 20s i'm gonna take over the business so you can rest that's great isn't it isn't it it's so great yes. I'm, I'm really excited for the future and for her future um and to see you know what she does whatever her heart you know desires um uh, you know i'm there for her. I want her to pursue her, her passions as well. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm so glad that we're kind of ending on this note. Uh Oh, that we're ending on this note because the, the question that I wanted to ask you is, is around what, what is your future like and what are your hopes um, for yourself and your family as you're making this huge shift um, and you're, again, I mean, you're making this shift for your health and for your family. And so what are you hoping to experience or for your family to experience um, as you, at least for this period in your life, um, really embrace being a solopreneur and um, working outside of the corporate sector? I really hope that we have more together time. Um, I really want us to spend more time together. Um, and I have the opportunity to be able to do that, you know, while the kids are on break and we, you know, we do different events and my entire family is with me, you know? So yes, mm. I, I'm a solopreneur with like my own little traveling band, uh, behind me, <laughs> you know, so everyone is is a part of the, the show. Everyone's a part of the business. Um, I want them to use this time to understand that, you know, mommy will always prioritize family uh, mm -hmm. and that it's family first. And, uh, you know, it's always going to be, you know, family first. Um, I want them to understand, you know, entrepreneurship as an option. I was not raised that way. I was right. raised that you must go and you must work for someone else. That that is yeah. that is the only success. And I want my children to see another route, another way, another avenue. Um, nothing has to be just one way. Uh, so right. uh, I want them to experience that and the excitement you know, that I feel and the nerves that I get in my stomach right before I have to run a class or right before I have a speaking engagement, but it always ends well and you feel a level of accomplishment um, just for putting yourself out there, you know, and, and trying to do things that you might have thought you could have never done. So I'm just, hey, uh, my birthday's coming up. Uh, I'm going to launch this book on third-party risk, so I'm um, still working on a title, but it's really made for the little the little business owners, you know, to make sure that awesome. you keep yourself self and your business in order so that you can position yourself for that corporate client. Um, I mean, I've been writing books already. I have a STEM guide for black girls already uh, that's out on Amazon. Uh, it's called Drones Taking Flight. So, you know, I got a little bit of the writing bug. <laughs> I guess so. Yes, which is something that I love to do. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not opposed to, you know, going back to, to corporate. I just want to be very mindful that it's the right opportunity, uh, the right culture, um, and make sure that I'm able to maybe speak up for myself, mm. you know, um, in terms of what what I can do, what I cannot do, you know, because I think a lot of that has to do with being able to articulate 
whoa, you know, like, okay. Yeah, what our boundaries are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, this was a very good learning experience for me. Um, I am enjoying being able to make breakfast and go for walks and take the kids to the pool and just spend, you know, this family time. So it's, I guess it's mommy camp for mommy too. Um, you know, <laughs> that I'm getting to spend so much wonderful time with them, um, and teaching them and, you know, instilling really good values in them over this summer break. So, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, just be comfortable embracing change, I think is the, the theme of the entire experience is that things are going to change. You know, you can take control of the change or you could just allow things to keep happening, you know, to you. And I, I took control over the fact that I was not in an environment that was working for my body, for my mind and for my family. Yeah. And, um, it's the wildest thing I've ever done and the best thing I've ever done for myself. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us, Roxanne. Oh, can you tell us you. where can we learn more about um, Black Girl Drone World? Oh, yes. All right. So you can go to our website, which is blackgirldroneworld.com. We are all over social media. So uh, feel free to follow us, like us, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn. Um, but yes, and we have regular um, information sessions for anyone that might be interested um, in learning a little bit more, curious about the space. Uh, so just uh, look on our website and you'll get more information on how you can join an information session. Awesome. And so are those information sessions open for people who are outside of your age range as well? Yes. Yes, because, uh, you know, we always are looking for allies, supporters, uh, volunteers, uh, you know, it, it definitely takes a village. So, yes, anyone who's interested and wants to hear more, learn more, come and join us. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Impostrix Podcast. I appreciate your support and that you continue to listen week after week after week. I've got some exciting news, which is that you can now listen and support Impostrix Podcast on the Alive Podcast Network app. You will find ad-free listening to nearly 100 other Black-hosted podcasts in addition to Impostrix Podcast, and you'll be able to support those podcasts and really kind of get into your groove with that app. I hope that you will join me over there. I appreciate your support to connect with me Feel free to join me on Instagram at Impostrix Podcast. You can also join me on Facebook in our validating space. Um, just search for Impostrix Podcast. All right, until next time, be validated. <laughs>